possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. And there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. Right. It's over the bar. Hello, welcome to the RTE GA podcast. Hope you're all doing well. Uh, Mikey Stafford and Rory O'Neill with you as always. And we've been joined by Shane Dowling. How are you getting on, Shane? Very good, Mikey. Thank you very much. Good stuff. We're here to preview the weekend's Allianz Hurling League action, which uh, always comes with a health warning. The old uh, previews of the Allianz Hurling. Because we all thought Wexford were going to beat Clare a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, they didn't. It was, it was a close one, but, you know, they didn't. Came out the wrong side of that one in the end. Um but, you know, just wanted to start by saying I've heard what all those other podcasts have been saying about us. And, um, you know, we, we've just been waiting our chance. We've been waiting our chance. We're going to show all of them. You know, we know, we know we haven't pasted up on our podcast no, studio wall. Yeah. No, I was just thinking about this, uh, the wonder of siege mentality in, in hurling and kind of working yourself up into a ladder. The world's against you, the long grass, etc. And it comes off the back of um, interview TJ Reid. Arguably the greatest hurler of all time, uh, but that doesn't mean you can't have a wee chip on your shoulder. Um, he was speaking at the Gaelic Writers Awards there uh, last week or the week before, and that's kind of held the quotes off for this week. And uh, even though he doesn't look like he's going to play in the league, but so the stuff he was saying about Bally Gunner and um, Bally Hale was almost more interesting. Um, he, he ranks that semi final win up there with his um, biggest wins of his career. Uh, which is interesting for a man with what has he got five, six All Irelands, four anyway. But he, um, everyone was talking about Bally Gunner being the best club team ever, were they? It was a bit disrespectful after what our club Bally Hale Shamrocks has achieved over the last 10 years. Bally Gunner beat us in the final a year ago, so to get revenge, revenge is sweet when it works out. Uh, Shane, did was anybody thought about Bally Gunner as the best club Ireland team of all time before that All Ireland semi final? I don't know about the best club team, but there was a lot of talk about him. But I think if you remember, uh, you know, Colin Fenley coming out as well a couple of months ago. Saying, he didn't oh, like the victory speech. speech. So, yeah. Whatever. The, spe- whatever. the speech, I think, annoyed them. Yeah. I'd say whatever whatever happened, was whether it was on the field that they're not saying, or the speech that they're saying was so disrespectful, I don't know. But whatever it was, anyway, they certainly had a lot of ammunition held in the locker for 12 months. And by God, did they release it on, on that day? Because I actually, it was on the same day as the World Cup final. And uh, believe it or not, uh, down here in Limerick, trying to find a pub that would show the hurling and the soccer proved very, very difficult. So we ended up just, a uh, few of us uh, ended up just going down to the, the clubhouse in the Piershik. Uh, they, they were very lucky to have some great televisions and watch the hurling down there. And uh, the majority of us that were there, obviously on the back of losing to Bally Gunner, were expecting them to win. Whether that's disrespectful to Bally Hale or not, no, I don't you know. You can't say that, but, Shane. You can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, and I think that's they, what they have, they have the writing on the wall for 24 already. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, there you go. So uh, more power to them. You you need sometimes in sports you need to have uh, you need to have something to go after. And by God, did they hang on to that? Yeah, because like we've joked with about uh, this with Jackie Rory in the last couple of years. The, the use of the expression "waiting in the long grass" and Kilkenny, um, the Kilkenny intercounty team in fairness aren't at the level they were at you know when jackie retired or you know they're not winning all irelands every year um but they're still perennial leinster champions you know and like one of the top two three teams in the country and this idea that they're waiting in the long grass makes the rest of us chuckle they do they do like the kind of yeah the siege mentality is the only phrase for it really is it all brian cody's fault (laughs) yeah i'd say there's an element of siege mentality but there's also like it's just it's just called K sporting revenge i think to a certain extent as well they probably felt really hurt from the defeat 12 months prior to that that's probably what drove them on i mean i think what was more interesting in relation to the bally hale bally gunner whole 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 storyline was just the rivalry that was built up and shane is actually no better boy to you know to to tell us like when i mean he got into a fantastic rivalry with kula over a couple of all ireland clubs and I think it's a healthy thing, really, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, driving the competition on between two two top clubs. And if there's something that they can reach for to give them that little extra five or 10 percent, sure, let them off. I mean, I don't think uh, it's anything that is um, it's too big a deal, really, is it? I don't know. I mean. 
Yeah, I, I remember you were saying there about that we we have a big rivalry with Kula. Funny enough, our greatest rivals are probably Bally Gunner as well. I mean, but yeah, has, yeah. Well, it was it, getting out of Munster was so hard as well, exactly, Shane. Exactly, we beat them in eleven, right? Where where we shouldn't have beaten them really. Uh, we beat them again in was it fourteen or fifteen? I think we beat them three times anyway. And I remember in twenty eighteen we were going for five five titles in Munster. Uh, unbeaten monster. We were playing Belly Gunner in 2018 down in Turles and they hadn't beaten us. And obviously, that that's something they wanted to go after. I remember running off the field at half time and two of the Belly Gunner players turned around to us. I think they were, we were they were pinted up at half time. And it says, Today's the day that's going to end your monster run. Do you know what I mean? That they were really hell bent on that. And now, <laughs> it's not like lips. Waterford lads to be lippy on the field either. Like, no, it'd be it? very unlikely. <laughs> no. yeah. so, that's changed now. We're Belly Hale and all doing that to them. But anyway, it's the healthy rivalry of sport. It is, Shane, I suppose. You know, there's a lot of guff in the marketing around the, the club championship that can kind of make people roll their eyes a bit. But the fact of the matter is, the feelings probably are that little bit raw, more, more raw, more visceral, a bit more like it does hit home a bit more, I suppose, when you win or when you lose with your club. So I'm not altogether saying that what TJ Reid is saying here is, is nonsense, but I just think it's interesting that like he kind of held on to that and kind of expressed it quite so strongly in the month of March, or maybe it was late February when he did the interview that, that, you know, that it's still, it's still in him. Like, you know, he's still thinking about it after that, you know, since, you know, December, um, it shows, as you say, that just that defeat last year. And for some reason, the rather mild victory speech did really, really rile up the Ballyhale lads. And maybe they need something to rile them up now because the Kilkenny championship strangely has become not a walk in the park, but like they're almost expected to win it. So maybe they do need a big bogeyman. Yeah, you do, and this is it. And I mean, sometimes in sport, and no matter what team it is, and it happens at intercounty as well, there's just something that you cling on to. Something happens at some particular time in a match or in the aftermatch or, or the aftermath or beforehand where a team and a management team and a group might just cling on to something for dear life. Uh, and I don't think, it, 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 whether it's club or whether it's county, it can happen at any stage. So it's, nothing might happen for a couple of years, but as they, whatever that was, they clung on to it and anyway, more power to them. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, no, it was a, uh, it, it was a bit of crack, um, and um, I just the fire is still there. Uh, it does seem Rory he won't be back for the league. Yeah, but I don't, uh, I don't think uh, Ling will be losing too much sleep over that. Let TJ get rested. Let TJ get himself fit and firing, and get him back for the round robin. But I'd imagine he'll probably have the rest of the Ballyhale lads back, possibly even for this weekend. They've had their break. They, they were drip feeding back in, weren't they? Didn't they drip, yeah, they, yeah. And I think Owen, we've already seen Owen Cody. Mm. I don't know, um, is Adrian Mullen ha had picked up an injury? So we don't know the, the story there. But you'll probably see a you know a, a more a, a fair reflection of Kilkenny starting 15 this weekend. I think they'll definitely want to go and put a marker down in in relation to Dublin. So I, from Derek Ling's point of view, I think it's a healthy position. This is usually a good time to do it as well, where you've had that little break week to start feeding players back in now that you might have um, that you might have been missing early doors. And look, it's just, I suppose, it's just something Derek Ling is probably going to have to get used to. The reality is, I'd say, every year from here on in, there's a there's probably going to be a Kilkenny team, whether it's Ballyhale or someone else, they're going to be going deep into the Leinster and All-Ireland and I'd say Kilkenny managements have always been planning for that. And um, look, this is now where things will <clears> hot up. I would probably take a slightly different view in relation to the league. I think these last couple of rounds might be slightly more tune ups. There'd be there'd be <coughs> there'd be a bit less shadow boxing now. I think teams you've not there's no break really. So I think if you're going to really start to figure out where you are in terms of team selection. We've seen it particularly now in relation to Waterford, where Austin Gleeson has been in and out. Does he start? Does he come on? I don't, I, I, I don't, you'd assume he's obviously going to start, but like, I, I, I get a sense with the games that we have this weekend, there might be a little bit less of a phony war than what we've seen heretofore. Yeah. There needs to be glory. Yeah, 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 much, yeah. Like. yeah, 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 yeah. We'll get onto that in a second. I just wanted to get your opinion, Shane, on the other burning issue of the moment, other than TJ Reid's vendettas. Um, it's more of a football thing, but we have seen it in hurling. And obviously Shane McGrath wrote his column about it yesterday. Shane McGrath, who's replaced you as our columnist, Shane, after you, after you left me, 
to your left feet in the Irish Daily Mirror. Scor- you were scorned. Mikey. Look at him. Look at him. Look, uh, look at him there now. Look at how guilty he looks for Shane. I'm only messing Shane. I'm very happy with my new Shane. He's he's everything I want in a columnist. <laughs> um, anyway, the other Shane McGraw was writing about You'll be waiting week. for that thing. Mike, you'll be waiting for that thing. Yeah, I'll be, waiting for, so I'll be waiting for Rory to book in for a podcast. And I, ma- I managed to get, what, about 10 minutes into it before I did it. You're lucky. Um, anyway, our other columnist, Lee Keegan, um, he was mentioning it today, and I think it's kind of interesting. Uh, he said in our era, he retired after last year's championship. Diving he retired something. in January. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> diving was something where if you did it, you got your ass kicked pretty hard whether internally or otherwise. I always think back to our Dublin games. If you went down softly, never mind a dive, you were getting a right boot in the arse from the next player coming to say, get up. That was the nature of the contest. Now, I think that's still probably the case in the majority of situations. And that was Rory's point on Monday's podcast, that this isn't like an endemic problem in Gaelic football and hurling. But, you know, we've had a couple of high profile examples in football in this year's league. We had Aaron Fitzgerald last year in the Munster Hurling Championship of all places. Just wondering, did you have any experience of it yourself, like an opponent or a teammate? You don't have to name names if you don't want to kind of go down easy looking to get somebody booked or get somebody in trouble with the ref. I did. I got caught once. I'd say it was 20. 15 I'd say uh, I'd say it was only 5 minutes into the game I got a straight red card I stood forward uh, and <clears throat> I shouldn't have got Clubber County off. What's that? Clubber County A county yeah yeah yeah. got sent off uh, wrongly or whatever and I remember TJ Ryan didn't have too many kind things to say about me afterwards I'd let the team down we were beating the same day trying to get out of Division 1B um, the following week Shamey Callan got sent off after a couple of minutes and happened to be playing in the same position I was playing in. <laughs> and a couple, it was about a year after that, I met the same referee playing. It was the last of the Railway Cup. And he came up and he apologised to me and he said that, just say the officials that he had with him, uh, you know, may have not been with him for too much longer because that, you know, he'd been, he got it, like he got it wrong twice, essentially, and the same player made a, made a fool out of myself and Jamie Cannon. And it's, it's, it's actually, it, it, there's two things. It's embarrassing for the person that gets sent off because they've done nothing wrong. And it's more embarrassing for the person that jumps to the ground. The only thing I'd say on it, right, is it's actually always been in the game, right? So there's no point in saying otherwise. Uh, it, it, it may be not as predominant as it, as it is now, but it has always been in the game. Plus, there's cameras at every game now, so it's it's picked it, up. That, that's the first thing. The second thing I say is that, like, if if I, and I've seen some of the uh, the incidents on social media, right? Like, if that is you or your teammate, like it afterwards, it's embarrassing for you. Like, people don't go up and give you a clap in the back and say, "Well done, there, kid. You got your man sent off." Like, that's not obviously if you get a dunt of a hurley, and I, I can't speak for football, right? It's not my sport. But if you get a dunt of a hurley, I'm sure it's going to hurt and you can, go, you can go to the ground or whatever. But this pushing and shoving and fellas, like, if a player gets sent off because a referee or a, a fourth official or an umpire or a linesman thinks that a player has, has hit a player and they've gone to the ground and he gets sent off, within days, that player should be getting a phone call, apologise, yeah, we got it wrong, no bother, like, you, you're not going to get a red card. And the player that did go down should just get punished. I mean, I don't see why they make big drama out of these things here. As far as I'm concerned, these things are very simple. If somebody gets a player sent off, you know, and by jumping to the ground when they shouldn't be, they should be subsequently banned. If a player gets sent off because the referee thinks that a player has hit somebody, he should just, okay, maybe not get a phone call, but his, his <laughs> thing should be rescinded very quickly within a couple of days. There's, you know, nobody likes it. And I guarantee you one thing, Mikey, right? If you are that player that jumps to the ground, you are embarrassed afterwards. Mm. You know, yeah. I, I, that, that, and you want to be fair, cold person now not to be. Do you know what I mean? That's, that's, that's where I see it, anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think the issue is because it's in the rule book that, you know, a yellow card can be given, Rory. I think if something, if a referee doesn't spot the infringement when it's a yellow card defence, I don't think they go back to, they don't retrospectively take action on yellow card defences. More more serious issues, yes, but for yellow card defences, my understanding is the CCCC don't kind of go back and re-referee a game, do they? Well, I don't think they're allowed um, mm. as per legislation. I think yeah. they're, they're precluded from doing that. So... Uh, if a referee has adjudicated it on the field, they accept what's in the report and they accept the decision. That's, I suppose, why Kyle Hayes ended up getting the ban this weekend was because um, Sean Stack obviously didn't see it and didn't didn't get, didn't give the red card at that at that point in time. So yeah, mm. and I mean, you know, I yeah. look. I'm not going to reiterate and you know, yeah regurgitate what I said a couple of days ago I I personally just don't really see it as that big a deal yeah fair enough um 
yeah, I don't. I think Limerick will survive without Kyle Hayes away to Westmead this weekend, Shane. And we won't talk too much about this game because um, uh, we will get on to Limerick's strength another day. Perhaps we'll give them a rest. But do you think this would be a good chance for John, John Kiley to bring back someone who hasn't seen any league action this year? I don't know, someone like um, maybe Aaron Galan. <laughs> How oh, did I hope I could have guessed? I said, that was very really just just throw it up there, my dear. Jump on that grenade there, Shane. Yeah. I think my wife, my wife, I was going out here, my guess. See you later, right? <laughs> <laughs> You know, well, what we've heard is he's been he, he's been training all along. The word is he went to Portugal for the training camp, so he's in the squad. He just hasn't been in a match day panel, so we're all assuming he'll be back in the match day panel at some stage. Sure. If, you, if you have that information, Mikey, and he's back in the panel, we don't need to go to talk anymore. You know, <laughs> what I would say is like you know, and I know sure anyone that that listens to this isn't going to blame me for a second anyway, but like <laughs> this is the beauty of the Limerick uh, of the Limerick setup. You know, from when I was in there and out of there, is that. Such a close knit that, and I, like I, I some of the stuff that you said there, I would be surprised if that's true because there's no way that a Mikey Stafford or even a Shane Dowling that obviously his connections were there would know these situations, right? The one thing I would say, and it's the only point I'm going to make on it, is whatever is the situation, can it just be said? Because if it's until it's until it's not said, uh, this conversation is going to keep on happening. Ah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. like. Yeah, exactly. again, six weeks time, I'm still no no more. You're still going to throw that grenade, and that that's going to be thrown out there up until the situation is dealt. Mm. That, that's all. That's all. That's all. I I'd like to know on it is you know what is yeah. historic. I yeah. I don't think that bothers John Kiley in the slightest. He he expects to get that question every time he faces the media, and he just he stonewalls it. And there's no better man to do it because he can you know make a fairly fearsome face as he says. I've got nothing to say about that, and there's never a follow up question. So I don't think that bothers him particularly. But no. he, it's a little bit of a sideshow, but. I think, I think Rory, if this was, and I didn't really mean to talk, but while we're on it, well, um, I think if this was, uh, go back a few years, Jim McConnelly and the dubs, it's like, you know, back page news nearly every day. Like it was a huge issue for some, like whatever way John Kiley is dealing with this, it's, it's a like talking play. point, but it's not yeah. a huge story. Whereas yeah, think you think about Jim McConnelly in the past, it was a massive issue or like, you know, other players who were left off panels. I think he's managed it quite well. I, I kind of enjoyed John Kiley's, uh, jousts with the media. He's like a Bible Belt politician. The way, the way he fends <laughs> off some of those questions. Um, he's, you know, and I think, look, I think he's managed it as well as he possibly could. It's, he's a star player. He's missing from the match day panels, and has been missing for the early parts of the season. It's going to be a story whether John likes that or not, or whether the Limerick camp like it or not. Aaron Galan is a big star, so him, his absence is going to be a talking point. That's. That's just the nature of sport. I don't think anybody needs to be making any apologies one way or the other on it. I think the important thing, I suppose, from a hurling perspective is that you'd hope he's back. I think, look, Limerick are a better side for it, but I think hurling is in a better is a better game for the presence of Aaron Galan. I think he's what he gives Limerick up front is something that maybe no other team has. And um He's just, uh, you know, like he's 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 been a huge part, played a massive role in their successes <coughs> so far, and um, I think if he's back, I think it'll be good for the game, good for hurling, good for Limerick, and good for all the rest of us to watch. Yeah. Okay, we'll move on, Shane. Don't worry. Um... I that's, think, two uh, dig, that's two digs now, Mike, in about 20 minutes. Right? What's a dig? <laughs> what is a dig? The second was a question. <laughs> to take the Kikeni phrase, I'll be waiting in the long grass for you at some point later. <laughs> <laughs> now, Shane, to go back to the issue of diving, if you'd fallen on the ground after the column comments, I'd have no issue. But you can't fall on the ground when I ask you a question. That's you. Know, that's why you're here. You know, you're, you're our limerick analyst, you know? Um, of course, of course. Yes. Um, we'll we'll move on to more painful matters. That being Wexford, um, oh. alas. So their last day out, um, six twenty five to one eighteen. They lost to Clare. Um, as I said before, that means when they inevitably meet Clare in an All Ireland quarter final this year, we'll beat them because you know it'll have to reverse. But um, Wexford's next three matches: Cork away, Limerick away, and then in the Leinster round robin, Galway away. So handy let's, run. Let, yeah, let's hope they've burned <laughs> off the dirty diesel. Shane, it's like, like he's he, Dar, he was making absolutely no. Dar Egan's making no apologies, and he was sorry, not no apologies, making no excuses. Like he, like he, he, he wasn't saying, "Oh, we were training," or "Oh, gosh, sure, we're missing Lee Chin and Liam Ryan and Matthew Hanlon." There was none of that. It was you know unacceptable, particularly the first half. Um, 
I don't think you were ever on the end of a hiding like that, but you definitely had a couple of demoralizing defeats, which had to be kind of recovered from, you know, in the space of a couple of weeks. And it can't be an easy place to be. I'd say anger can fuel a lot, but at the same time, you know, doubt has to be springing in about everybody, about their own ability, about the direction of the team. It, it has to be a difficult place to be. It does, yeah. And you're on about demoralizing defeats and how you come back for this was the, the biggest demoralizing defeat that we had was probably against Clare in 2018 down in Ennis, where we were going quite well and down to Ennis and, and got beaten and beaten quite well, like, you know. And I mean, obviously, we were able to turn that around, but I think. Obviously, I think there's things a bit deeper here that, you know, if you go back to last year's uh, league semi-final, Mikey versus Waterford, mm-hmm. um, they leaked six goals that day as well, I think, and they were they were, they were were hammered. And, like, sometimes you lose games by eight or nine points, and it's not great, but you, then you can say, okay, we're missing X, Y, and Z. But they were hammered that day. You know, okay, like, they cleared, they were close enough to Clare last year that subsequently got hammered by Kilkenny right and now they got you know they got a fair trim again this this year at home when I see stuff like that Mikey I just think that it, I don't is, is everything right right because mm. if you have everything right and you, you might have an off day and you might lose eight or nine points but you don't leak the goals that they leaked and you don't the effort and the energy that they show that's that's what would concern me do you know what I mean I, like losing a game is you get that happens in every sport right uh, but it's, it's how you lose is the thing uh, and you know the last like they've had a poor, a poor league campaign so far. If you want to go, like at least Clare, right? So Clare were useless against Limerick and Zion to get crowns, but at least they went down to Exeter the following week and they showed okay there's something there. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, they had a bad loss. Something was going on, but obviously there's nothing too deep because they're on that round going down to Exeter. That's that's the part that concerns me. Uh, and as you said there, look at the run that they have now over the next over the next couple of weeks. It's Darry Egan's second year. He probably got a pass in the first year. Don't get a pass in the second year. I admired his interview afterwards where he said the lads that uh, that came in, they're not showing us and they may not see game time again this year. I, I admired that. He put the he, he put the law straight out to everybody, but I would be concerned if I was in your shoes, Mikey. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. We're, we're well and well and truly used to it. Um Rory, there's you know, Chin. O'Hanlon come back and possibly Rory O'Connor. That that strengthens Wexford. Well, it si- puts a significantly. puts a spine. It puts a it puts a bigger yeah. spine into your team. Anyway, I'd sure. be I'd be happier if yeah. Liam Ryan was back as well, but he's not. Um, but you kind of like I don't know who we would want to be playing. Obviously, Westmead again would be nice. Can we not play Westmead again? But I guess you know Cork in Parky Cueve probably smelling a little bit of blood. It's you know, I, I kind of fear for Wexford a little bit. I don't know how you feel. It's it, it's it's hard to it's hard to gauge really until you see what kind of a team Cork pick and what kind of a team Wexford pick. I think the worrying ask the most worrying. I watched that Clare Wexford game there a couple of days ago again. I haven't and I won't. <laughs> I, I don't actually. I don't actually think Clare played. No, I wouldn't say that. I don't think that they played well. I don't think they had to play that well. Mm. I think that was the that was the really worrying aspect for me. I mean, I don't think Claire really hit maybe their straps. Were they in maybe third, fourth gear, maybe, and still ran up that score? That's what's really worrying. You all you hope is that you will get a response. I think it's a tricky enough fixture. The one caveat, I suppose, that you could probably attach to it is uh, Pat Ryan released pretty much the entire cock panel back to the clubs last weekend to play <clears throat> senior league games. And um, he took a kind of a... An they all got injured, yeah? No, well, well, <laughs> well, well, a couple picked, one or two did pick up a few knocks and you you just don't know what kind of a team he'll put out this weekend as a result. He still has a few lads coming back from injury as well. And you then show into the mix. I think they went up to Tipperary over the weekend. They got a good hiding as well in a challenge match uh, above in Dr. Morris Park. So... Um, I think from Cork's perspective, given you know what they've what they've got going on, it could be. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say be full uh, a full pick of you know like his starting fifteen in championship might necessarily be reflected on what we see this weekend. Having said that, I think Cork are building an extremely deep and very high quality panel of players. So whoever takes the field is going to present some challenge for Wexford. But I suppose, look, this is. This is going to be a test for them now. And this over the next couple of weeks, you listed out their run there. It's not easy, but we're going to see what they're made of. 
Yeah. But I think Mikey Rory, the I know we're not talking about who wants to and doesn't want to get to league final, uh, but the one team that definitely wouldn't mind getting to league final this year against Cork because they have mm. three weeks of a lead in yeah. uh, the championship rather than league. So what I would say is, I think Cork it's ideal now, for Cork actually if they were it, to make a league final. Yeah, it's ideal. So they've now put themselves in a position to to potentially get there right with another win on the belt. So I think Pat Ryan said, okay, we're here now, so we may as well get to league final, try win the league, go on to piss that night. Reset mm. the button and we've two and a half weeks lead at the championship. So it could be perfect for Cork. So they're in a position now, they may as well go and get to the league final. Mm. Yeah, that's that's exactly my fear. Um but at the same time, she, she, Roy says, What kind of team extra put out what type of there's like Dar Egan has to put out the strongest possible team here, doesn't he? He has oh, to yeah. try and exercise what happened a couple of weeks ago. There there's absolutely no point in any more shadow boxing or any more get blood and young lads here f- for Wexford. This has to be his strongest fifteen and the strongest bench he possibly has, doesn't it? Yeah, and, and funny, like, you know, the league, you know, it can be detrimental in the city. I don't think you can't gain a whole pile by the league, but I think you could lose a lot. But mm. I mean by that is that if he was to put out the strongest team that he has available to him, right? And Cork put out, I would say, a mixed team or a lot, whatever, ten or something, whatever it is, and Wexford don't perform mm. perform perform badly. No, not that it's not already. The confidence is through the floor of the management team, the players. How do you pick it up then going into championship? So that's the risk by playing. Your, so if they're eager to sign, we're going to full trial for this. I want to see a response. This is the team. It's up to you now, et cetera, et cetera. And next thing, they don't perform well. You're in a bad place going into championship then, aren't you? Yeah. Uh, Rory, I'm going to not be an optimist, but just to at least say the counter argument here is they've beaten Westmead. Like they're basically, their form at the moment if you take the score lines out of it and just look at the league table, it's similar to what Limerick did last year. I'm obviously saying, take, you know, like, you know, coasting through the league and making sure you don't get into a relegation playoff was pretty much the tactic of John Kiley and the All-Ireland champions last year. So obviously you don't want to go losing by 40 odd points, but at the same time, they're safe now. So, you know, perhaps, <laughs> you know, yeah. it really doesn't matter. And all this hand wringing and weeping I've been doing is a waste of time. I, I, well, look, do you, to, to go back to Shane, what Shane mentioned earlier, um, I think the league, everyone's all about the league when the league is on. Like Dara knows, he's, he's, he will be assessed at the end of the year and how they get on in that Leinster round robin, uh, Leinster championship campaign. Nobody will give a tuppenies worth about um, a 20 or 30 point player back in February or March if they manage to make it out of that group stages. But as you mentioned, given the run that they have, given the way their confidence is now, given the fact that he's probably going to have to go back to a lot and a lot of the tried and trusted, he may have to be slightly more direct on Sunday. I wouldn't necessarily see it a day for experimenting with new puck out strategies. It probably will be a lot of route one and old fashioned hurling whereby you're just going to have to get stuck in and try and get really stuck into Cork because apparently Cork, you know, are the dainty hurdlers and aren't able for the physical stuff, which is another load of BS. But anyway, I think that's going to be, it, 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 there's going to be a lot of old fashioned values attached to Wexford's campaign from here on. But what happens in February or March isn't going to define Dara Egan's tenure as Wexford manager. And I think that needs to be his focus from here on, I would suggest. Yeah. Okay. We'll move on to matters that, don't make my heart hurt. Um, Claire and Galway on Sunday, Shane, uh, I think could be a, a blooded, yeah, yeah, it could be a tasty enough one. As Rory was saying before we came on air, if they're going to meet in championship, it's not going to be until the month of semi final, quarter final you know, stage, like quite late, yeah, yeah, June kind of Shane. So, um, Claire will should have their tails up after aforementioned whomping of Wexford, and Galway kind of won't be very happy, like. Henry Sheffield can't be happy with the defeat against Cork, a league, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But still, um, I'd say he'd be very happy to see a performance now against the, you know, local rivals and all that. So, um, this could, this could be, this could, this might, this one might not be a phony war in the league. We think, we hope. Yeah, it shouldn't be like, and you know, we're kind of going back there to the whole, uh, you know, it's not, it's not when you lose a game, fine, but it's how you lose it and. Uh, I didn't see much. I saw the highlights of the of the Galway Cork game, so I can't really talk much about it uh, because I didn't see a whole pile of it. But I did 
see all of the Limerick and Galway game. Uh, I was disappointed with Galway that day, if I'm being honest. I, I mean, I know Limerick were miles better than them, and still in all, with five minutes to go, there was only two or three points in it. Do you know, so that, that is something that can be positive from, from a Galway viewpoint. But I just didn't see any fluidity in the hurling. Now, I know, can anybody get fluidity in the game of hurling in a match in Salt Hill with that breeze that swirls around? There, so that probably is quite. Uh, they're probably well used to playing there at this stage. So I think, like, like what we're saying is that you know, so Brian Lawn has now got a performance out of Clare. Like they, they did a very good win early doors against Westmead, right? I know you can take it for what it was. Um, obviously they were very poor against Limerick and they were very good the last. So at least Lawn has kind of seen something. Whereas I think Henry now is going to. No, I know Joe Canning made a good point on League Sunday last night. The, 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 the players they were missing, I get that. But uh, if like Galway are all earning contenders, there's no point in saying otherwise. That's on, we're based not on the back of last year's form and last year's semi final game versus Limerick. The one thing that Henry probably would have noticed last year in Crow Park is that the strength and depth of his panel wasn't there. So I'd say, that, and, and Rory is spot on what he's saying in relation to the number of managers that won't be judged in February or March. And, I, and Henry's no different there. So he's probably trying to give all these younger lads a bit of game time, get them experience, see who he has, so that when June or July time does come again, that he knows knows exactly who he, who he can bring in uh, because they've already done it for him. And I would imagine that he's using the league for that, whereas he's not any bit concerned about, but I want he's not concerned about getting results, but he wants to build a panel of 20 or 22 players that he can go to war with in three weeks' time onwards. Yeah, that's, I guess that's it, Roy. It's not the, it's not the perform, it's not the results for Galway, as, as Shane says, that we're all that concerned about, but this idea that, you know, they're all Ireland contenders, we really expect to see something, some kind of a spark, I think, during the league. Maybe we don't need to, again, go back to the case of Limerick last year, who who uh, showed a little spark against Offaly to make sure they didn't get relegated and it didn't do them any harm. But, you know, Limerick had proven themselves at that stage. I, I don't know. You just feel like, do you want to get one performance from Galway where, you know, you know, Conor Whelan, Evan Nyland, and these lads just absolutely light it up and you stand back and you go, Wow, you know, Jesus, Shefflin, that that's Shefflin's Galway. That's the team we were expecting to see. Do we need to see that, or can they just wait to do that to poor old Wexford in a few weeks' time in the Leinster round robin? Yeah, I like I I think the players missing is a key aspect, and I think one player, like I mean, look, he's I think Dahi Burke is he's kind of a spiritual leader for them in a lot of ways. You know, like he, I think, and look, he he's still yet to come back. Um, I think he makes such a massive difference. I think when he goes into that team, uh, do I see him conceding as many goals? Now, in fairness, I think they tightened up really well against Limerick the last day in, in a defensive in a defensive sense. They didn't concede any real big goal mm. chances. Did Limerick get a yeah, half but even a chance? Yeah, Dahi Burke, Dahi Burke coming back in means Grove McInerney goes out the field, and then that's mm. a, that's a big addition but, out the field. Isn't but, it? but I think I think. Gerard McInerney's best position has always been number six. And I think Henry is very much in that Kilkenny mantra and that Kilkenny school of thought, whereby like Kilkenny Hurlow, generally speaking, if you look at the way they set their teams up, they don't worry too much about corner forwards or corner backs. They make sure three, six, nine, eight, nine, 11 and 14 are solid. And they build around that. And that's basically what Henry is taking to Galway too. I think you can see that as well. In terms of the way their team will be set up, it will be a lot of the big trunks will be laid down right through the middle, and then he'll try and fill out the rest with you know a little bit of a little bit of quality. But I think they, I, I, I think the biggest disappointment for me against Limerick was the the fact that it was you know look Limerick and Cork will say you know two big teams going up to Salt Hill, and. They never looked like winning either game. I suppose they had a 20 minute burst in the first half against Cork, where they were the better side. And um, as soon as obviously uh, they had a sending off early in the second half and they got a bit of a blitz and that was the end, that was game over. I think from a Limerick perspective, it was almost a in a boxing match. You know, they were just kept at distance and they never really landed a major, major punch on Limerick. You always felt Limerick were going to win it, uh, even though as... We said, as as you mentioned a couple of weeks ago, they did manage to get it back down to two points at one stage. So I'd say from the home perspective, getting a, a sense of morale and a bit of a boost from the supporters, I think that would have been a disappointing aspect from Henry's point of view. But I think there'll be nothing better to whet <clears throat> the appetite than going down to Ennis this weekend. That's a fantastic, because that's a real derby. I mean, I think people mm. sometimes outside of Hurland don't realise there's a massive rivalry there. 
different. Obviously, it's a little more acute and slightly more intense between Limerick and Clare. But it's quite there as well, isn't it, Shane? Between Clare and Galway, they would consider themselves real border and, uh, you know, enmities. And they'd be, uh, I'd expect plenty of timber anyway, that's for sure. Yeah, even go back to that. Do you remember at uh, uh, 21, was it the All Ireland final? Clare versus Galway. Uh, I don't know what year it was now, but Joe was playing and he got about 10 goals and 20 points, and Daryl Conan got about 8 goals and 16 points between the two of them, right? Like, so you, you, even when you go back to that, some of the games over the years between Clare and Galway have been savage. Yeah. For whatever reason, they don't just, you know, the way they draw falls outside of the. the, the, the Provincials, they don't seem to, to meet that often, but mm-hmm. when they do, it's actually one to look forward to. It's just it is. To see the whole pipe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I was wondering just before we move on, uh, maybe the last game we'll look at in any detail the Watford and Tip. Before we do, Connor Whelan, Shane, what, what do you make of the experimenting with him kind of out the field in the half forward line? Is is there a future to that, or is Henry just kind of taking a look? Because to me, he's one of the most dangerous inside forwards in Hurling, and it seems that kind of to me, it seems not a waste of him, but it seems not the best use of him to play him in the half forward line. I agree totally. I think he's class. Uh, if anything, I think I think he could be underrated, right? Do you know, I I yeah. think he's very very good, and maybe doesn't like I've seen him get scores that very few other forwards would get over the last number of years, like uh, but. I think I think inside is is where I'd play him definitely. The problem I'd have is that just with the Galway style of hurling, it is that I put it to you this way: if Connor Whelan was corner forward for the Limerick team the last couple of years, he'd be an all star every year, right? Because mm-hmm. of quality of ball that they're able to get in. Whereas Galway are a small bit more direct, i.e., the goal they got against Limerick in last year's semi final, where a long ball went in over Mike Casey's head, and obviously there was a goal, right? So I just don't think that the the style of play that Galway play. Uh, suits him being inside at times so I can see why Henry's out you know come, uh, is bringing him out the field where you can get him a bit more involved he can pick up these thir- you know balls to the half forward and he can and play over the bar but I, I I think they seem to deliver the ball to the full forward line from a lot further back the field than what most other teams do and because of that it just doesn't give him that advantage and he can be a small bit easier to mark uh, but in saying that he's still very strong in the air he's very strong full stop uh, but I can see why Henry is bringing him out to the half hour line. But for me, I'd still have him inside every day of the week. Right. Okay. Um, that's interesting. Okay. Last game we'll look at is Tipperary v Watford, um, which is the only uh, the only Division One game on Saturday evening. Rory and obviously there's mm. a nice kind of storyline here. Liam Cahill uh, in charge of Tip, welcoming his old team, and kind of makes. Makes me think of that lovely exchange when Davy was in charge of Clare and he came up against Waterford and reminded some of his former players how many All Irelands he'd won and asked them how many they'd won. <laughs> Don't see Liam Cattle doing that now, Roy. No, do you? no, no, definitely not. No, um, I think Waterford to me now are the team I'm probably looking forward to most seeing this weekend. They've been slightly hidden away, I think, by virtue of maybe the quality of opposition that they faced here heretofore, be just and. Probably a lot lower in profile in comparison to obviously some of the front runners, and that's unusual given the fact that who their manager is. Um, they've made a couple of big changes. I think he's he's found a couple of players. They've got um, Fitzgerald from Bally Gunner. I think you know we know him. He's you know um, they have another lad from Killer Asante. I think he's. You know, you've gone from a lot of athleticism, a lot of pace, a lot of power. Um, they're selecting a really, I think, a re- very athletic and very um, deep running half back line. They think they've kind of switched Jamie Barron into the forwards. Um, put potentially a little bit weak in their own full back line. Still, maybe you can get at him with a little bit of joy on that front. Um, we, we will definitely see a sweeper. Um, from a Waterford perspective, that will that's a that's a given anyway for most Davy teams. Whether it's one or two, I think is really is the uh, is the question. And um, I think this weekend, given the fact that the two teams don't meet in the championship until the end of May, which is all of what it's over two months away, I think this will be full blooded as well. I think this should be a good contest, and um, yeah, the intrigue then around the sideline battles, I think, just adds to it. But I don't know if it's as significant anymore i think the given the condensed nature of the championship i think people just simply don't have any time for for sideshows that you just have to put your head down and <laughs> you know keep running because the whole thing will be over before we know it like given water but not but not water, running into jason ford no Wat- waterford have a very very <laughs> tough start in the space of six days they have they'll 
they'll, they they opened their campaign against the four in a row chasing All Ireland champions in Thurles. Now that might necessarily that might actually suit them. And then the week later, they have to go down to Parky Cueve in Cork. So Waterford season will be effectively that week. That week will that's 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 the Waterford hurling season in a nutshell. Yeah, well, the the logic is Shane that there's no there's no greater manager in inter county hurling for that first season bounce than than Davy Fitzgerald. And as Rory says, we haven't really had a chance to assess anything yeah. yet because. They drew with Dublin in a game which by all accounts was was for a first game of the season was a bit of a belter and then they beat Leash and they beat Antrim. So we had they haven't been tested yet as much as you get tested in the league. So you'd imagine, as Roy says, this will be a chance to see something of Davy Fitzgerald's Waterford 2.0. Yeah, I think, but <clears throat> I nearly disagree what you said about, you know, no greater manager for the first year bounce. It can have to be the second year with him. <clears throat> Is that the first year that he, you know you, you go in and improve and but the second year seems to be if you just go back over his track record, mm. right? But uh, that's that's kind of neither here nor there. But I think it's funny, right? So just I like Tipperary in any other year uh would be had probably built up at this stage now to be the potential other champions in the run of their league, right? Uh not being Kilkenny, like they've had some great results. Uh, but it's because of the transition and the players that have retired and all that's gone on over the last probably maybe 12 to 18 months that there's literally no, there's no expectation. I'd say Liam Cad is delighted. There's no expectation. There's no talk. I'd say even if they win at home the weekend, there'll still be no talk. They'll go into the most championship and be all Tipperary in transition the way they go. I actually think so far he has done a fantastic job with them. Did I hear you say there, Roy, that there was a challenge game last weekend between Tip and Cork and Tip came yeah. a bit of a highland. Yeah. yeah. So like yeah. everything they seem to be doing, they seem to be winning quite well. So I would expect Tip to win this weekend um, as simple as I think you know with the players that he's had he, ha, um, the players that he has at his disposal he's done a fantastic job I was raving about Cahill and Mikey Beavens last year I don't know Mikey Beavens but I just I, I, I think he's I want to say similar to Paul Canor because I don't think there's anyone in that category but just from the way he carries himself from seeing the way they, they, they play the game I just I'd say he's very very good and Cahill is raw within, you know, and I'd say a young Tipperary team that hadn't been used to him before, I'd say his rawness is probably something that they need and that, that they're buying into. Um, so I, I, I even given more um, more talk and more to Tipperary, mm-hmm. more than ever, Fair because, point, yeah. because yeah. they have their, their league results have backed it up. I mean, think about Waterford, forget about their manager, forget about what they've done over the last couple of years. Um, you know, they were poor in, you know, the majority of their game so far. Right. I mean, they drew with Dublin, but Dublin, Dublin's results so far have been inspiring. So I, I need to see it from Waterford, where I have seen it from Tipperary. So that's my point in that case. The other thing I just want to ask your opinions of is that, and maybe you've spoken in this already, is, and I know there's been a lot of, of airtime given to the famous Waterford man behind the goal with the earpiece and the communication, everything goes with it, right? But what, like, what do you think of basically amateur GA players? spending so much time training and doing tactics and video analysis and so on and so on. Yet on game day, they're not allowed a message being brought into the field. Am I on my own here to think that this is just absolutely ridiculous? Not alone not being able to get communication onto the field, but not being able to get a drop of water? <laughs> I mean, I, I was doing a club, I was um, doing early this year for Napier Street, right? And I mean, I genuinely thought I was going to be escorted up to, to, to Mulgrave Street here in Limerick up to the prison for going onto the field with a drop of water to the players. And I was told in no uncertain terms then that if a player wants a drink of water, he has to come over to the sideline to me. And I'm thinking, but 55 minutes into the melting pot, a fella's out on his feet. And you're saying, but if you want a drop of water, you got to run 50 yards over to me. Why are we doing these things like that? Now, can I ask Shane? Was it was all you were carrying now was a drop of water or would you have had a message as well now or a bit not, of a... Not, a single, <laughs> not a single thing. So yeah, fair fair point. No, it was hurlies and water. And if you wanted to give someone a drop of water, it was like as if you were going into I don't know what. I just think it's a disgrace. Yeah. It's it, come here, come it seems here, a, a bit over Mikey, the top. Yeah, it does. It is Mike Mikey. But you know one thing that I've that I've, that's always struck me about it. And look, maybe it's the next evolution, and maybe it's something maybe it's something that we just should just legislate for. You know, I I do have a problem to a degree around the whole area of the mayor for now because I think fellas were taking the proverbial with it. Um, and it was probably happening more in football. But would I see anything wrong with a microphone and a helmet and a manager being able to talk directly to the goalkeeper? <clears throat> I wouldn't see, I wouldn't see anything wrong with it whatsoever. If there was a little microphone maybe a one-way communication system where the manager can basically say to the 
chat to the goalkeeper around whatever he may want to talk to or whatever any player. I mean, is that, to my mind, hurling is in a in a in a in a slightly more advantageous position where it can actually accommodate that types of technology because of the virtue by virtue of the fact that they wear helmets and you know we look the nfl i mean i don't think when tom brady used to run onto the field he didn't have someone in his ear i think it's just accepted and i think it would make for interesting uh it would make, it would make for interesting script content if we were able to get the <laughs> transcribes of Davy Fitzgerald's uh, interactions with goalkeepers oh. and what <laughs> I, 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 I think sometimes like uh, the lad behind the goal, for instance. Yeah. Look, I mean, I'm not too sure how much value you can draw from that, but I just think sometimes on certain issues in, in a hurling context, particularly, we should be slightly more open and embrace change and, you know, and be more like technology, technological advancements. My yeah. point here, okay, fair enough for the communication. I, I definitely disagree yeah. with that. But a player not being able to get a drop of water, yeah, having to yeah. go to the sideline, yeah. having to wait for the break of play or a physio or a first aid to run in, like what a load of. But yeah, even not... even on the even on the communication side of things, like how how big an issue is this? Because you even hear this from, like soccer is a slower game. Um, it's it, in ways more tactical because there's and a fewer on field. the pitch, smaller field, fewer on the pitch. Um, and it, you know, managers will admit, "What are you shouting in your order?" Oh, geez, I don't know. I'm just doing it. A lot of the time, they don't hear me. You know, I'm just. It's almost done to make myself feel better. And you know, Enda McGinley's column this week. Um, that's another columnist we have, Shane. Don't worry, I've found loads of columnists. <laughs> um, he was kind of saying that you know we can overplay tactics in Gaelic football. That sometimes, like Tyrone showed at the weekend, sometimes. You just need to bloody want to win the thing and you just need to go out and like you just need to work harder, make more blocks, you know, make more tackles, run harder than the opposition. And you're just saying in Hurland, Hurland, even at the level I play, Hurland's a bloody frantic, fast game. I don't think there's any hassle, get, any problem getting messages in or using a tactics board during a water break, because really, once the game has started, Shane, and like oh. teams have kind of set out on their style of play and the it's yes. how much how much effect can you have how much change can you actually make in a game once it gets going Shane I disagree anyway Mikey straight up I, it's not as simple as that right I've been in many situations in recent years where small nugget of information has proved a game changing scenario mm. right so uh, and and um, I just think that in, in this day and age with what the players and remember the players are amateur people I keep on bringing that up right they all do we all do this because they all enjoy it and love it etc etc but just considering the work that they put in I don't see why they shouldn't be low get a small bit of help right yeah a bit no, of I help agree with you yeah. right? when you're in the middle of a game you're not thinking tactics in the middle of a game right you're thinking about a number of things but you can what's what am I doing wrong or what's he doing wrong or right? mm. you just need to be told something very quickly that may help you and the team's performance and that's all I'm saying so you know what forget about the word tactics can the players just get a bit of help and a drop of water? It's not much to ask. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't think either is unreasonable. I agree with you that. Um, uh, I, I guess the problem, Rory, is that the Mare Forna role was being abused to an extent. That's where marking space, they were oh, intercepting yeah. passes, for Christ's sake. You know? But also also doing it at opportune moments. So running in just would say the opposition were on, on a kick out. Mm. And okay, I'll run a loop here into that space, so, you know. And you could, you it was, it was definitely being done by design, and I could see why um, it was removed. But look, I'm sure there's other ways of doing it. I mean, when it, when when, it, when a team incursions, has a incursions free... incursions yeah. onto the field oh. are 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 something that maybe could have been curbed, but I don't see any. Or when there's a natural break in play, when when, when you know. Evan Nyland is coming yeah. back 30 yards to take a free from his yeah. own 45. Could the opposition not run onto the field then and give a bottle of exactly. water or a like quick message, are, et cetera? Yeah, yeah, like, natural breaks in the play. Yeah, and there are enough, you know, or you have appointed times when they're allowed in. Maybe you give him one per half. He hands a slip just like they do with the bloody substitutions. So I don't know. I think there's loads of different ways that it could be could have been managed rather than just pulling it completely. But, at the, but I think... In the grand scheme of the GAA, unfortunately, people couldn't be trusted to adhere to the spirit of it, uh, abused it, and then had privilege, privileges withdrawn. And I think that's a shame. 
Yeah. Um, we've one last game to have a look at in Division 2A. If the games go ahead, lads, I'm getting news alerts here saying, you know, yeah. status orange, snow, snow, et cetera, et cetera. We, we, might, we might have trouble yet, but there's one game in 2A, Rory, which is um, Kildare hosting Kerry in, in Newbridge, Cal- in Newbridge yeah. which um, we've been talking about them for a while now that they're on the rise and it has been, you know, it's been steady. It's been at club level as well, mostly at Nace, but we're told like it's kind of, you know, it's hurling is is moving away from Nace. You know, it's kind of other clubs are kind of building as well. Um, you would fear for them in Division One. Obviously, it would be a learning experience, but it would be more than that. It would be it would be it would be a status thing. It would be it would be a line in the sand almost if a Kildare team were to make it to Division One. However grim it might be once they were there. I I think it's potentially the story of the weekend. And um, it's a huge, it's a huge game. It's a huge game for both counties. And given the perilous state that Kildare football finds itself in at the minute, I think it's a brilliant opportunity for Hurling to grab, you know, some positive PR and to make some good news, good news waves for itself. Uh, you'd hope they get a big crowd. I think there will be. And um at the Kildare people come out and give them a bit of support. And I think it would be a massive boost for hurling because you have to bear in mind, Kildare are well capable of fighting on dual fronts. It's a massive county, big population. It's a feeder county now and a commuter county in a big way for, we'll say, the pale area. And they should. They, there's enough people and enough bodies in Kildare that they should be able to compete on two fronts, hurling and football. And football people should be seeing it as some sort of threat. I think there's been incredible work done in NACE, particularly they won an All-Ireland Intermediate title last year, which is, as anyone will tell you, given you know how difficult it can be between clubs coming out of Munster and Kilkenny teams, that was a fantastic win. Um, huge boost there. But the big thing for me was, if it got to the stage whereby they managed to get promotion up to the top tier, what I would love to see is the GAA at central level to have some sort of plan and say, okay, we potentially here have another county that are doing fantastic work within the county. So let's go and ask them, ask them, what do they need? Let's blanket bomb them with support and try and give them, go and ask them, look, uh, look what they need. The obvious thing is what they'll obviously come back with. But money isn't always the answer in these scenarios. Um, but to go in and say, right, that it, could you imagine, could you just imagine a county like Kildare being able to get up onto that next level and get in there to compete and make a, a have another county uh, competing at the sort of elite level in the hurling context? It'd be such a massive boost for hurling in general, uh, given the size of the county, you know, the playing population, as I say. And I just think like it it would represent a real opportunity for the GA to go in and, you know, have a good strategy because we've seen this before with teams that come and then they fade away again. And I think if Kildare have put the work in, they deserve some support if they make it up onto the next level, that is. Yeah. And of course, everyone in Munster will be cheering from shame because they don't want Kerry coming in and messing messing up their precious Munster <laughs> championship. So they'll be cheering. Kildare will be everyone's favorite team in the Joe McDonough down your way. Yeah. <laughs> ah, listen, uh, to echo Rory's words. It's very exciting for him. And I, listen, I, I, I only had kind of one real experience. I remember I was over in the Pearson under four team at uh, at Fela level uh, in 2018, and uh, we were down in Cork. It was on, and we were playing the because the quarter final, and we were playing Nace. Uh, in the in the quarter final of fourteens, and um, they beat us by two points. And I remember going into the dressing room afterwards just to you know, say well done in a few words. And like I would have liked to thought that I had to buy it at some out of a professional level and doing things right. And I would in and hear all the players foam rolling and doing all these exercises that I didn't even <laughs> I was hardly doing myself. <laughs> so, so I and it, I just it opened my eyes then. That was four or five years ago now that said geez these, this club anyway I can't speak for Kildare but this club are really at a different level and obviously it's paying fruit now so fair play to them yeah they, our, our colleague Damien Lawler I'm sure he won't mind me t- saying this he's like um, he lives in Nace yeah. and uh, he was like thinking when he moved to Nace he said ah sure I'll, I'll tip down and play a bit of junior hurling and he went down he was like these <laughs> these yeah. lads aren't messing around. Really I don't like, yeah. I don't know if this is the the social hurling I was looking for. To be honest with you, you know. So um yeah, Nace are a serious op- uh, operation. But as I said, like you know, 
there you got round towers and, and kappa and others now kind of coming on and that's that's really what they need and david herity at the top kind of doing a good job and great job it is exciting yeah. because we, we we banged the drum here a lot we were talking about antrim a few weeks ago and how we re, you know you need antrim kind of competing at that top level and like and they're an established hurling county but if we could add a new one to the mix oh lord oh. Hurling, it would it, it would be a huge thing but go in there like get in there now and say, wait, what have you done well? What have you done right? You're obviously doing something right. Okay, what can we do to help you now take it on to the next level? Yeah, and that's a blueprint then that can be used in other counties who want to build their hurling. Like so, Wexford. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, write, don't, I write their, don't write their epitaph. Just no, yet. I'm only joking. Um, we'll we'll leave it at that. Um, I'm clearly got a I've really got something stuck in my cross. So I better leave it. No, um. That was a good chat, lads. Thank you very much, Shane. And thank you, Rory. Sure. No game on the telly this week, but obviously you can keep across all the action on uh, Saturday and Sunday sport, mostly Sunday sport, and uh, the RTE website and the RTE news app, the home to um, Hurling's number one columnist, Shane McGrath. <laughs> <laughs> That's four digs, Mikey. I'm done now, Shane. My, dra- my draft. <laughs> I'm, done, I'm done now. I'm done now. Um, you. You, you know I love you, Shane. Uh, we'll chat to you all on Monday and we'll have a look back at the Harlan. Good luck. Goodbye. Thank you. by winning the last two matches on the road and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it! He hits it! It's over the bar! Oh! Holy Moses! <laughs>